I was saying, y'all, it's your boy Rico from Street Schools, and I'm finally coming with the updated Washington Commanders cap space video, man. How much money do we have left to sign top free agents like potential safety Justin Simmons, who's still available for some crazy reason? All pros and all, leading the NFL in interceptions since he was drafted and all. Of course, we're going to do a breakdown of the Washington Commanders cap hits, especially of the new signings, and also who are the highest cap hits that we have on our roster right now. And what is it's a big gap from the guy that's third to the guy that's fourth. It's crazy. And then also, even outside of Justin Simmons, what are some other free agents that are available, some veterans? How much will they cost? What's their market value? How good are they still? What's their age? All of that type of stuff. So we're going to do a full cap space dive and remainder free agency dive. And of course... I'm going to say this at the end of the video as well, but I'm not expecting us to sign anybody before the draft at this point, but that doesn't mean that we won't sign anybody. Remember, we made some of our biggest signings after the draft, like Josh Norman was after the draft. I'm hoping we don't have another Josh Norman situation where we sign a guy and then make him play out of position. He's more of a zone guy. We ask him to play man or like William Jackson, man guy, asking him to play zone, but still you can still make big signings after the draft as well and i just feel like strategically we're gonna wait till after the draft to make sure that we didn't get safety within the first two rounds and they may feel like getting a justin simmons is pointless or whatever position but either way before we dive into all of that i'm sorry for already wasting so much of y'all time before we get into this video make sure you still follow that like button still follow the subscription button and still follow the bell next to that subscription button to get a notification each and every time i release an informative and opinionated video just like this one make sure you follow the facebook the tiktok the instagram the twitter i'm keeping y'all updated daily on those websites and even doing content over there that i'm not even necessarily doing on youtube make sure you click on the stories as well because there's a lot of interesting things going on there so make sure you stay tuned i'm about to start coming to y'all with film sessions all kind of stuff especially as we get to like within a week of the draft super film sessions on the way so make sure y'all stay tuned and without further ado let's go and get to this video right now let's get adam adam All right, so first of all, the Washington Commanders officially have $43.4 million worth of cap space. Now, granted, a couple of the signings that we've made very recently have not been added just yet. I mean, you even have guys like Mikael Walker have already been added for less than a million. A lot of these deals are for less than a million, like Tucker Addington, less than a million. Davion Davis, less than a million. Jeremy McNichols, the recently signed running back from a few days ago, less than a million. A lot of these contracts are in like the 985,000, 983,000, somewhere all the way down to like 915,000 range. And then you also have some like undrafted free agents that were re-signed practice squad guys that are getting paid somewhere in the 795,000 ranges. So pretty much even if every single person that we've signed so far in free agency have not been updated, everybody's making such minimal money, whoever hasn't been updated yet, that we can pretty much assume the yeah, other commanders have somewhere around at least $43 million to work with in cap space. And of course, they're not going to spend it all in one offseason. They would like to carry some over for the next offseason if they want to go get some big guys there, especially if going into this draft, we don't find a way to address a, a really talented starting left tackle maybe they go all in on one in the 2025 free agency you just never know so they're gonna hold on to their money you never know if they want to hold on to money to extend guys that are already here maybe they want to go ahead and give samuel cosme a big contract maybe they want to go ahead and pay terry mclaurin long term ahead of time maybe some of these other top players that we have on roster or even if some of these free agents that we just signed to one year deals this past year ball out maybe they want to save some money to extend those guys long term you never know but either way with that 43.4 million dollars worth of cap space that we have somewhere around there we still are second in the nfl in cap space the patriots are first with 46.9 million dollars we are second with 43.4 million dollars and then there's a big gap from second to third like we only have 3.5 million dollars less than the patriots who are number one ahead of us going from the commanders second place to third you go all the way down to 30.8 million dollars 
a whole 12.6 million dollars less than what we have crazy and then it just goes down to the eagles to the Chargers, to the cardinals everybody's at around 31 million dollars or less and again we're second place with 43 and the patriots are right above us with almost 47 and just to put it in perspective also so you could argue that we still have the most total offseason capital out of the entire nfl right now because the year the bears have the number one overall pick but they only have three more picks after that for the rest of the draft they have four picks in this entire upcoming draft and they are 12th in cap space right now with only half of what the commanders have again the commanders have 43.4 million the bears have 22.46 million like right barely a little bit more than half of what we have and then even if let's go to the patriots who have the most cap space in the nfl by first of all only a little and then they pick third behind our second overall pick in the draft and we have six top 100 picks in the draft while they only have three top 100 picks in the draft so even after signing the most free agents in the nfl out of any other nfl team and it's by like a nice gap by at least like five six players to the team that's in second place i believe the miami dolphins we still have the most capital this offseason as of today to do any further roster up upgrades that we want to do out of the entire nfl and luckily for us a lot of people feel like there's a steep drop off in talent after the third round so this is like literally the perfect draft to have a lot of second and third round picks in and remember we have one first round pick which is second overall who knows maybe we trade back up until the first but as of what it stands right now we have two seconds and three thirds and again a lot of draft analysts and scouts feel like after the third round it's a deep steep drop off so you better rack up on second and third round picks we already did i believe we have the most top 100 picks in out of every nfl team in this upcoming draft so again second in cap space the best draft capital total out of the entire nfl overall we have the most off-season capital to still work with even after signing the most free agents in the nfl by at least five players to the guys in second place now let's take a look at some of these notable deals when we're talking about 2024 cap hits bobby wagner's the biggest one with the 6.5 million dollar cap hit on a one-year deal that's not bad at all marcus mariota technically a second string quarterback and him being a six million dollar cap hit isn't bad at all even though i don't like marcus mariota even though i hope that the number that he's wearing number zero is the amount of throws that he ever attempts for us at all at any point in this 2024 season outside of the preseason six million dollars is still pretty cheap for a backup second string quarterback remember jacoby Brissett was making 10 million dollars last year so that's 44 million dollars cheaper even though jacoby Brissett is obviously easily better than marcus mariota so that maybe that's the difference there then doris aren't but again ideally hopefully no quarterback ever throws a pass for us this season outside of the preseason other than our second overall pick who we end up taking Jaden daniels drake may whoever then our second biggest our third biggest cap hit my fault and this is the first guy that isn't signed to a one-year deal is Dorrance Armstrong. And he's only a $4.885 million cap hit in 2024. Then Tyler Biadish is a $4.15 million cap hit signed to a three-year deal. Then Jeremy Chen on a one-year deal is a $3.925 million cap hit. These guys are getting paid pennies for the level of talent that they could bring to this team. Hopefully, Jeremy Chen balls out and he's betting on himself, but he's also betting on Dan Quinn, Joey Jr., and Jason Simmons to get the most out of him. Maybe even Ken Norton Jr. as a linebacker because he's going to be someone, somewhat of like an outside linebacker, hybrid safety role type of guy. But either way, he's betting on himself and his coaching staff to get him that next big contract he's willing to just take a cheap one-year deal in a system that he believes can get the most out of him so he can cash in in the 2025 offseason and i hope he does because jeremy chin talent wise deserves way more than less than four million dollars per year on in a deal right now so hopefully he balls out on this one year deal goes crazy and then we have the money and are willing to pay him big money to not lose out on that continuity right there and that ridiculous talent then frankie luvu i feel like our best sign in this entire offseason is on a three-year deal as well and right now he's only a 3.865 million dollar cap pit that's insane now granted some of these guys with the multi-year deals like dorrance armstrong and tyler biadish all of those guys are bigger cap hits later down the road they're very 
very cheap this year for a reason that's by design we're gonna dive into that with the whole system of how the 49ers run things it's already apparent that Adam Peters is going to do the same thing. We're going to talk about vesting dates and what's that mean, what that means and everything. So just stay tuned for that. But just continuing on with the whole cap hit situation, Cleveland Farrell, one year deal, $3.75 million cap hit. Our starting kicker, one year deal worth $3.6 million of a cap hit. Nick Allegretti, potentially our starting left guard, three year deal, only a $3.583 million cap hit this season. Michael Davis, going to be one of our strong contributors in the cornerback room. Maybe Maybe even one of our starting corners over a Benjamin St. Juice or over Emmanuel Forbes. Right now, it's a clean slate. Every man for himself. Everybody has just as much of a right to become a starter for this team right now. You never know if Michael Davis is able to beat out one of those other guys. So you potentially have a starting corner, at worst, a strong contributor, a Kendall Fuller replacement, basically, in Michael Davis on a one-year $3.545 million deals, man. This is ridiculous value. Dante Fowler, a situational pass rusher, coming off of his best statistical season last year under Dan Quinn for Dallas is only a one-year deal worth $3.25 million. Then Austin Eckler, he's been killing the NFL. And I believe over the past, what, over it was at least over a three-year span, he had the most touchdowns out of any player in the NFL. And that was just like a couple of years ago. We signed him to a two-year deal that's only worth $3.23 million. And the way the deal is set up, that if you want to, you can really cut him after this season. So it's almost essentially like it acts as like a one-year deal. Cornelius Lucas, potentially a starting left tackle if we don't, Sign a guy that you feel like can start day one, even if we were to find a way to trade back up into the first to get like an Amarius Mims or maybe even like a JC Latham or somebody. If you just don't feel like that they can start at left tackle week one immediately, you have your starting left tackle making only $2.8 million against the cap right now on a one year deal until that starting left tackle is ready to go. All pro Jeremy Reeves, I don't care what position it is, I know it's special teams, but an all pro player on a two year deal and his cap hit this first year is only 2.045 million dollars and then after that you just keep going down and down and down michael dieter is basically our new west schweitzer even though i feel like he's more center maybe than guard but maybe he is more guard than center you never know either way he's on a one year 1.785 million dollar deal james crowder our projected starting returner with the new rules and system and everything that's going to be in place he may be able to kill it he's only making 1.31 million dollars on a one-year deal you just keep going down and down and down and it just gets crazier crazier way cheaper and cheaper and higher value and all kinds of stuff adam peters killed it dog he killed it and something super random that i also noticed while looking at our list of free agents that we signed in their cap pits we signed three jeremy's in one off season super random i know doesn't impact anything but i just wanted to point that out because that's just where my brain went with that looking at the list what does everybody have in common right there also just a reminder of who we lost from the 2023's team curtis samuel went to the buffalo bills kendall fuller went to the miami dolphins Antonio gibson went to the patriots Cameron curl went to the rams jacoby Brissett also went to the patriots with antonio gibson cody barton went to denver so Deke Charles went to Tennessee, Joey Sly went to Jacksonville, Casey Tua went to Buffalo along with Curtis Samuel, Jay Smith Williams went to the Falcons, and Kalik Hudson just recently went to the Saints. And of course, remember that we also traded Montez Sweat to the Bears before the trade deadline along with Chase Young to the 49ers before the trade deadline, who is also now with the Saints. So the Saints now have more players from the Washington 2020 draft class than even Washington does right now. With Chase Young and Khalid Hudson on the Saints, that makes two that they have. And Adam Peters' commanders have a total of zero right now, which is absolutely insane. That draft was not that long ago for us to have no players from that draft. I know Adam Peters was going to come in here and do a clean sweep, but golly, man. And then after all of that, who are our biggest cap hits out of the entire team even outside of the free agents that we just signed in this 2024 free agency cycle who are our biggest cap hits we have terry mclaurin as our biggest cap hit this season at 24.1 million dollars worth of cap hit deron payne second as a 21.61 million dollar cap hit and then jonathan allen is third with a 21.441 million dollar cap hit then after that there's a huge drop off you have your projected starting right tackle and andrew wiley who's a 9.4 million dollar cap hit the 
reason you can't cut him is because you cut him you save less than two million dollars he will be a 7.8 million dollar dead cap at that point you might as well just keep him but next year i'm pretty sure we can get out of that contract and end up saving a lot more money which i hope we do i mean i feel like andrew wiley was better well the better way to word it he was less bad the second half of the season he was decent he was serviceable the second half of the season first half he was horrible but the second half of the season i don't feel like a lot of people noticed because the season was kind of going down the drain and a lot of people probably tuned out but andrew wiley was definitely better the second half of the season i still don't want to go into this season assuming week one he's just starting right tackle i hope we bring in somebody from the draft even if it's like a second or a third round pick to at least compete with them but hey man a projected starting right tackle as a 9.4 million dollar cap it is not bad at all it just sounds bad when you're looking at the fact that bobby wagner's fifth in your cap hits list making 6.5 million dollars a year and andrew wiley is definitely not a better right tackle than bobby wagner is a middle linebacker but that's just the way that it basically is really ron rivera and those guys set and adam peters up for failure here because now adam peters has to deal with this contract that has so much dick cap if you cut him this year whereas if you wait till next year then you can get a lot more money back so it's not really adam peters' fault that he's dealing with andrew wiley right now and then sixth in our top cap hit is marcus mariota with the six million and then seventh is dorance armstrong then eighth is jamin davis then ninth is tyler biadish then tenth is john dotson and then 11th is jeremy chin then it's frankie luvu then it's cleveland farrell then it's tress way i mean you get to tress way within like what the top 15 of our cap hit samuel cosme who you could argue was our best player on the entire team last year is what 15th the 15th biggest cap hit we have on our roster right now is your potential talent wise all pro right guard i feel like again the best player on our team i would argue if you really look at the tape last year especially the second half of the season like the starting from like october on samuel cosby was the best player on our entire team dog and so we're gonna have to pay him big money soon he's not about to sit there and make less money than what the punter is making right now because he's still on his rookie deal and he's he was a second round pick so we don't even have a chance to get a fifth year option on him so we're gonna have to pay him big money pretty soon but your 14th biggest cap hit is a punter. Your roster sounds like you should be ready to lose a lot of games. But we're just lucky because we have a lot of guys on high value contracts making way less money than what their talent really deserves, to be completely honest. I mean, your, your punter is 14th and your kicker is 16th. That's amazing right there. But a lot of these guys are on young contracts from their rookie deals. A lot of these other guys got signed for extremely cheap in free agency. Because, again, I told y'all months ago we would be a top free agency destination. No longer will we have to deal with the days people coming here to tax us with the mentality of, yeah, I'll come play for the Burgundy and Gold, but I'm about to charge you way more than I would charge another team because they're potential Super Bowl contenders. They have a great culture or whatever. And so if I'm going to come here, I'm going to have to get every little penny out of y'all that I possibly can. Whereas a a lot of these guys definitely i'm not saying everybody that we signed a free agency did but i'm quite sure a lot of these guys turned down bigger money with other teams to come play for us i mean i know jeremy chin had to have been offered more than a one year four million dollar deal from other teams out there with the ridiculous talent that he has but again he's betting on not only on himself but this coaching staff to get the most out of him to show that he deserves a big time contract coming around 2025 so again top free agency destination down we, we, we were able to negotiate some of these contracts to be way lower in cap hits than they should have for guys like frankie louvu especially getting frankie louvu on the deal that he's on right now is absolutely insane man it's apt he deserved way more money than that he's so underrated y'all will see when the game when the season starts man also shouts out to mofo pod my boy calling over there with all of the stats and things like that for answering this question so you have at the two knuckleheads on twitter burgundy and gold podcast he asked serious question anyone know what's the connection with washington giving everyone three-year deals versus four to five year deals is that the work of eugene shinden analytics my boy at mofo pod replied most free agents perform at the level of their contract for one to two years so shorter deals are better for teams than previously thought they typically want longer control but it doesn't usually work out and that's a great point right there that's why adam peters didn't give 
I don't know if y'all noticed, but we didn't sign a single guy for longer than three years. Even a guy like Frankie Louvu, who I would, I would personally just go ahead and give him five years because I'm so sure that he's going to be one of the best linebackers in the NFL for the next five years and beyond. But Adam Peters was like, nope, I don't care how good you look. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how much you fit the scheme. Three-year deal at best, sir. Take it or leave it. And these guys, again, being a top free agency destination, like I told y'all we would be, are actually taking these deals. It's actually pretty phenomenal and another thing is that the commanders are utilizing a very late vesting date let's go ahead and get to that so shouts out to jason underscore over the cap for pointing out the fact that the commanders have brought with them the 49ers april 1st vesting dates for their contracts now what does that exactly mean before we get to like the real definition of vesting dates i just want to show you how Adam Peters is literally bringing with him what he was doing, what John Lynch and those guys were doing for the 49ers. This is pretty rare how they set up their NFL contracts, especially with the best in dates. Now, if you look at an article done by CBS's Joel Corey, the title says agents take the five best teams at managing the salary cap and player contracts. And of course, the 49ers are one of those five teams that they feel like are the best at managing contracts and salary caps and things like that. The article goes on to say, San Francisco's most lucrative veteran contracts historically have had a team-friendly structure. And Adam Peters is definitely bringing that along with them. Guys buy in with the vision. I mean, we may not be Super Bowl contenders now, but the way people are believing in a vision and seeing the light, Hey, it may come sooner than you think. Maybe we can have the same exact turnaround that the Texans had going from number two overall pick to winning the division the very next year. You never know. And then the following year, making big trades for guys like how they did for Stephon Diggs. Maybe we make a big trade for Brandon Ayuk the next offseason. We'll see. But the guarantees after the first contract year are injury guarantees, which typically become fully guaranteed on April 1st of each specific contract year. San Francisco's guaranteed vesting date is the latest in the entire NFL. With most teams, the guaranteed vesting date is in March during the first few days of the new league year. While everybody's still scrambling around and signing free agents, they're going ahead and giving them their money immediately. The 49ers' biggest offseason signings have lower risk because of their contract principles. For example, Quan Alexander signed a four-year deal averaging 30 $13.5 million per year, which is near the top of the inside in linebacker market. The 49ers are protected in case Alexander doesn't bounce back from last season's ACL tear. Unlike most contracts of this size, the first two years aren't fully guaranteed at signing. The 49ers can get out of the deal next year with minor cap consequences because Alexander received only a $4 million signing bonus and 11 point two five million dollar 2020 base salary which is guaranteed for injury doesn't become fully guaranteed until that april 1st san francisco would have only a three million dollar cap charge in 2020 if a healthy alexander were released next off season before april 1st just to let you know the reason we're talking about 2020 and things like that i forgot to tell you this article was written in 2019 so when we're talking about Quan alexander signing for big money for the 49ers we're talking about 2020 this article came out in 2019 but it's just breaking down how the 49ers do business and how it relates to the commanders we're going to get because of the commanders soon so the large annual game day active roster bonuses are also standard with 49ers veteran contracts that's something adam peters is potentially going to do here as well the primary benefit of the roster bonuses is they provide the 49ers some financial relief with injuries the per game amount is payable only if the player is on the 46 man active roster for that particular game so the way that the 49ers have done business for years, the way Adam Peters is going to do business for the commanders is very team friendly and players. It definitely hurts them more than anything else. It protects the team from a player underperforming, being hurt, being injured, whatever. That's the way Adam Peters is setting up his contracts. I don't know why more teams don't do it. It's crazy. Now, when we're talking about vesting dates and vesting guarantees. Here's the actual exact definition of what that means from over the cap themselves. They say agents love to pump up the numbers for a player by getting a team to agree to massive guarantees in a contract that they then report into the media. The majority of these guarantees are not real guarantees. Usually they cover injury, which means teams are free 99% of the time to release the player as if the guarantee did not even exist. As the start of the new league year draws closer, these injury guarantees vest on a certain date and become fully guaranteed that the player is still in the roster as of that date. 
Then, and again, the 49ers have the latest date, and the Commanders are following suit. Now, we're the only team, two teams in out of the entire NFL that have that extremely late April 1st vesting date when money becomes officially fully guaranteed for players. In some cases, the vesting aspect is simply in place to allow the NFL team to bypass an archaic rule about setting aside money when a contract is signed to cover salary that is guaranteed for skill termination. You can generally see this when looking at the construction of the contract contract and realizing that the large salary cap penalties or upfront money paid in the first year of a contract are going to block the release of the player. In most cases though, it's simply the team throwing a bone to the agent who should realize that the guarantee is worth very little. It's usually nothing more than a catastrophic insurance policy for injury basically. So again, what it generally means, I'm not gonna lie, it's really, it's like a difficult concept for me to break down exactly why this is such a great thing for teams. But shouts out to at Raja Krish on Twitter for doing a pretty decent job of wording it. He said it means that they vest a month after the standard March 1st, which most teams do it on that date, again they do it april 1st as i understand it it gives them team flexibility to cut a player post march 1st and pre-april 1st and have way less dead cap space because of it so all in all again it seems like the type of thing that is great for a team and bad for players and it's just phenomenal that the way we're setting contracts up like this we haven't recently been to a super bowl like the 49ers have and teams and players still want to come here and sign those very team beneficial contracts very against players i mean if somebody for some crazy reason were to get hurt or for some reason the, the commanders just didn't want to actually end up signing that guy say we the first week of free agency we're going crazy with signing all of these guys and then maybe we end up signing somebody better at that same position we can literally be like well it's not april 1st yet we don't really have to pay you we could cut you right now and basically lose nothing from it or if you were to get hurt for any reason before april 1st we can cut you then as well it's it's crazy i'm surprised that players sign for that but again that just also further backs how much of a free agency destination that we are the players were even willing to sign these type of contracts also continuing on well over the cap the last date we usually see though it can be later is april 1st which is used almost exclusively by the 49ers and all of their contracts in this case all the free agency has basically been completed and teams resources are used up these players are at a big disadvantage if in late march the 49ers were to approach the player about the possibility of being released if he refuses to re renegotiate his contract that's evil man so all of this free agency stuff's already happened. Anybody that say for, for safety specifically, say we signed a safety during a legal tampering period or like immediately after the new league year started mid-March, like in the teens. And just say by say like March 20 something, they just with the april 1st vesting date they approach them like hey man i know we said we were gonna pay you this but you either take this pay cut or we just cut you now what you gonna do and now they're in an ugly situation because it's like what can i do every team that needed a safety which i am have already filled their safety needs with safeties all across the nfl i'm out here just on an island right now with no team i'm either gonna have to take an extreme pay cut and make way less money than i was originally agreed upon with this team or i'm gonna end up getting cut and not making really any money so players end up in an ugly situation when teams do this april 1st date and again the only teams doing it are the 49ers and now the commanders are doing it because adam peters is bringing that same strategy to us i hope i did a pretty decent job of explaining that let me know if i didn't i could try to explain it in another video as well and so now after all of that let's have some fun let's get away from the statistics the super facts and things like that let's have some fun let's loosen up a little bit let's dive into some available free agents that the commanders could still get that could help our team win some games in 2024 and maybe even beyond first of all of course starting with safety justin simmons i mean four times second team all pro 2019 and 2021 through 2023 this is very recent y'all this is not like he was just great years ago he was just second team all pro last year also two-time pro bowler 2020 and last year 2023 and he was the nfl interceptions co-leader in 2022 just a couple of seasons ago and since being drafted 
in 2016 he's led the nfl in interceptions and again if you want to change the bar if you want to move the goalposts, even since just 2020 he's led the nfl in interceptions out of every single player every safety every corner every player possible he's led the nfl in interceptions since 2016 and since 2020 whichever way you want to look at it this guy is different and again for dan quinn and joe Wood jr who pride themselves on leading the nfl and takeaways the past three years with the dallas cowboys to bring in that same mentality to the commanders i feel like justin simmons is the perfect fit i like a lot of safeties in this draft but none of them are justin simmons but then again who knows maybe a lot of people didn't even think justin simmons would be that great coming out of the draft but you know who did adam peters remember adam peters was a part of the denver Broncos staff that drafted justin simmons so there's that strong connection there there's the great scheme fit that dan quinn joe with jr and jason simmons what they want to do with this defense be very takeaway heavy be interception hunting and things like that especially with a great pass rush even if it's got to be schemed up as a great maybe we don't have like elite pass rushers like a micah parsons here but dan quinn is going to do everything that he can along with joe wood jr to scheme up a pass rush and i can see this secondary producing a lot of turnovers just like the dallas cowboys have the past few years and he's just come on dog it's the perfect fit man if you want to be aggressive justin simmons is the best safety by far available especially at this point i felt like even entering free agency he was the best safety available especially for what they want to do and now of course with a lot of safeties already getting signed and going out all to all kinds of teams He's easily the best one right now. So if I had to pick, if there was one signing out of all of the free agents that we're going to even discuss in this video, anybody that's available out there right now, I would pick this one in a heartbeat. Just, Justin Simmons is my number one free agent available that I would love to sign. I wake up every morning hoping to see that notification. And when we're talking about market value, they're expecting him to get like a one year 11.1 million dollar deal or somewhere like two years same annual value 11 million dollars per year in that deal i'd give them that again when you're looking at cap space rankings we can give them that deal and we would still be second in cap space in the nfl again there's that big gap going from two to three from the commanders to the titans we could pay justin simmons exactly what his market value is and i'm just gonna let you know that right now i don't think he would even get that much money from any team and again, like I already said, I feel like if we were to make any top free agency moves, any significant ones for a guy like Justin Simmons, it's more than likely going to happen after the draft or any team that ends up signing them. Even if it's not us, it's going to happen after the draft. Everybody's waiting. Pretty sure even his agent is telling him wait till after the draft to see what teams really need a safety. I'm pretty sure teams are thinking the same thing. Before I go and sign Justin Simmons to big money, let me make sure I don't find a suitable safety in the draft for way cheaper. So he's going to more than likely sign after the draft. You're going to have to wait till after the draft draft for that but again just to let you know we can sign justin simmons to an 11 million dollar deal according to his market value which again i don't even think he's going to get paid that much money but even if he does and we give him that 11 million dollars we would still be second in cap space in the nfl we would still have more than the third place titans that's absolutely insane again i just don't see why you wouldn't do it at this point for me I don't, forget the draft go ahead and sign him now please tomorrow please today matter of fact hurry up now moving on also david bakhtiari now i feel like cornelius lucas as may be trustworthy enough to where he can start a left tackle until the guy that you draft hopefully you trade up in the first round to get is ready to start a left tackle for you to protect this huge investment we're putting into a rookie quarterback second overall that's a big time investment right there we need to make sure we have somebody that can protect his blind side unless it's michael Penix and he's left-handed so technically wouldn't it be his blind side then now it's the reverse now the right tackle is more valuable for him but you know that's a whole another complicated situation that even though I like Michael Penix Jr., I hope we don't end up in that situation. I don't want to take him second overall. I don't even want to trade back to get him. I want to take Jaden Daniels and Drake May second overall, point blank period. Of course, I'm leaning more Jaden Daniels and Drake May, but I'd be happy either way as long as it's one of those two guys. But back to my main point, David Bakhtiari, even though he played 55 snaps last season because he's just been super injury prone these last few years, he still had the highest pass blocking grade. If he were eligible, if he played enough snaps to be eligible enough to be ranked by Pro Football Focus, you take that 89.9 pass blocking grade, that would have been the highest out of the entire NFL. That's ridiculous, dog. So I know, yes, he's injury prone. 
Yes, I know that he's up there in age. This man is 32 and a half years old right now, according to Pro Football Focus. So he'll be 33 at some point this season. I don't care if he only plays one full game for you. I will take David Bakhtiari for the cheap. Because why not just go ahead and sign him to the same deal that you did that the Jets got for Tyron Smith. And after I saw the deal that once you break it down what Tyron Smith got, I would have easily have given that him in a heartbeat. Both of these guys are extremely injury prone, but when they are available, they're still, both of those guys are still top five, top, at worst, top 10 tackles in the NFL. And according to Pro Football Focus, they're both the best two pass blocking tackles in the NFL, according to the grading system. But when you saw Tyron Smith deal, you saw one year deal worth 20 million you're like oh nah no way but then when you look at what the deal actually is it's only 6.5 million dollars guaranteed he's only a 6.5 million dollar cap hit y'all a starting left tackle i don't care if he only plays five games this season that's still worth it same thing with david bakhtiari because he can get up to 5.75 million in first play time incentives he can get up to 6.25 million in second play time incentives 250,000 per playoff win one million dollars max and five hundred thousand dollars worth of pro bowl incentive which reaches up to 20 million dollars so i would have done that in a heartbeat any day of the week and i would even be willing to not only just do that for tyron smith but david bakhtiari as well but maybe even cheaper than that because tyron smith even though over the course of their careers tyron smith has been, been more injury prone than david bakhtiari because david bakhtiari's first like four years i don't believe he missed any games if anything it was only like single digit games a year but then like these past four years if you just go back to like 2020 david bakhtiari has been far more injury prone than a tyron smith and i feel like you could potentially get him cheaper than even what tyron smith just signed and i'd be willing to give him the tyron smith deal in my in personal opinion and also i highly doubt that this happens but especially like especially after we sign michael davis i super doubt this happens but stefan gilmore still a quality corner out there definitely fits dan quinn and joe with junior scheme you know how why you know how i know because he literally was just their starting corner one of their best corners last year deron bland was getting all the interceptions but you still need that cover corner that can lock up a receiver especially the taller contested catch receivers like the mike evans is the dk metcalfs and things like that deron bland is graded to getting interceptions but i don't expect him to cover mike evans keenan allen justin jefferson and all of those big contested catch receiver guys that's more of a stefan gill more type of thing and maybe benjamin st Jude steps up and does that for us maybe again michael davis does that because he's a longer corner as well and again like i already said because we signed michael davis i feel like this is way less likely but still stefan gilmore even at 33 years old and he'll be 34 by the time this season starts but this guy will at some point during the season he was 11th in targets in the nfl last year but yeah he was only tied for 26th in receptions allowed that means he was targeted the 11th most, but still only allowed the 26th most in receptions. That's incredibly efficient. His overall grade last year was 74.4 with a 76.1 run defense grade and a 72.3 coverage grade. That's a well-rounded corner right there. That's not just a guy that's only there to cover. He's going to contribute against the run as well. So it's really hard to scheme against that guy. I feel like he would be the perfect counter for a guy like an Emmanuel Forbes, who's going to be like your Deron Bland is going to hunt for interceptions to Stephon Gilmore could be your certified, I wouldn't necessarily say lockdown corner at this point in his career, but very trustworthy, very dependable, far more dependable than what we have in Emmanuel Forbes and Benjamin St. Juice. Even if Emmanuel Forbes realizes his first round potential, I still see him more of as like an interception hunter, like more of a Marcus Peters, more than ever being like a true cover blanket receiver that can cut that can completely just shut down a receiver for five plus seconds in a game and on, on any given play. Um, so I would still like the sign Stephon on Gilmore even with Michael Davis here but just to let you know again highly doubt it happens and then I don't know maybe spot track is broken but they estimate Stephon Gilmore getting the same exact money as Justin Simmons at an 11.1 million dollar deal I definitely would not pay him anywhere near that at all I would not give him that even as much as I would like to get him I wouldn't do that I mean Stephon Gilmore was almost a 10 million dollar cap pit for the Cowboys last year nah I'm good but even then, I don't see how his market value would be $11.1 million. He didn't even make that last year at the age of 33. Why would he make more than that at the age of 34? So I'm pretty sure, especially with the way that Adam Peters is doing his contracts, like we've already covered, 
that Stephon Gilmore would get nowhere near that $11.1 million if we were to go sign him. But again, the fact that we signed Michael Davis pretty much just went ahead and put the nail in the coffin and the chances of us getting him. But you never know. If he's willing to come here for an extremely cheap deal, why not? And then if you want to have at least one strong veteran presence in the safety room, if we don't go and get a Justin Simmons, you also have Marcus May, who was described as... Remember, he was released by the Saints, is athletic, smart, and tough. He will take chances and chase shiny objects at times, but his instincts are usually pretty good. He just needs to stay healthy, which has been an issue over the last three seasons, with 28 games missed over the last three seasons. So it's more of like an injury concern thing than anything else. Sign him to a very cheap one-year deal. Why not? Veteran presence in the safety group, which doesn't have one. I feel like we have veterans in pretty much every room and on our roster except for safety right now at least dependable strong veterans that have done it for a long time is Derek Forrest our oldest safety and this guy missed the entire last season I mean I guess Jeremy Chin is one of our oldest safeties as well this is a very young group this is probably our youngest position group out of the entire team right now so I just feel like going to get Marcus May if you don't go and get a Justin Simmons I feel like if we don't address safety within the first three rounds because again there's potentially a big drop off after the third round in talent pretty much everywhere across the board except for receiver receiver is the deepest position in this class this is arguably one of the deepest receiver classes I've ever seen since I've been really paying attention to the draft process this is arguly one of the best receiver classes period it's, you have some elite guys at the top that will be wide receiver ones and other drafts and then you just have so much depth across the board outside of receiver after the third round it's a drop off so if we don't address safety within the second or third round of this upcoming draft then and if we somehow miss out on justin simmons which i feel like is just a perfect scheme fit adam peters our now general manager was one of the main peoples that that drafted them for the denver broncos i just don't see how that doesn't happen Happen. we have the cap space to afford them it just makes too much sense but if we miss out on Justin Simmons and don't take a safety within the first three rounds of this upcoming draft Marcus May makes a lot of sense and I feel like he could play very well behind this potentially deadly front seven that we're putting together right now allowing him to take more successful risk in college and to go crazy I, I really can see that happening so you miss out on Justin Simmons don't be surprised if we go and get a guy like a Marcus May and also again with the current safety market Marcus may can potentially come extremely cheap and again with the way Adam Peters has structured his deals this offseason if we would assign Marcus May I'd expect it to be on a very cheap one year prove it deal I wouldn't expect anything more than one year I'd expect it for, to be even less money than what Jeremy Chen is getting and for the same one year prove it deal but again, just to re-emphasize, to be completely honest, I'm assuming that we don't sign anybody significant, anybody notable, anybody that I basically mentioned in this video, any of these example names that I've given you over the past 15 minutes until after the draft. I think any signings that we make before the draft between now and the draft on April 25th will be special teams guys, extremely deep depth chart guys, camp body type of guys that we don't even expect to make the 53-man roster. People I don't even feel like they really have much of a chance of making a 53 man roster anybody that could potentially even have a chance of starting for us at any position group we're gonna wait till after the draft and more than likely sign those guys just to give you the heads up but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in the video please still follow that like button still follow the subscription button still follow the bell next to that subscription button so you get notification each and every time i release an informative and opinionated video just like this one make sure you stay tuned for all of the content again i'm gonna keep you all updated on a lot of things now just to warn y'all i will be busy over these next few days so i may not be able to get film sessions to y'all and it's gonna be a lot going on but i promise you once we get to like within seven to ten days of the nfl draft i'm about to start getting film sessions to y'all and i'm gonna start tackling a lot of the controversial players too like my dog amarius mims i'm gonna show y'all that this guy has the highest ceiling out of any tackle in this draft class we're gonna of course do some Jaden daniel some drake may film sessions or some of my favorite players in the draft some of my favorite sleepers like darius robinson a lot of those type of guys so make sure you stay tuned for those film sessions stay tuned to all of the content i'm coming to hit y'all with and of course i've already scheduled it now so you can go check my channel go to my channel go to the live stream section and go ahead and click notify me and let me know that you're waiting because i'm live streaming rounds one through 
five at the very least round one day one on thursday april 25th rounds two and three on friday and then rounds four and five at the very least on saturday so make sure you pull up to those live streams then we're also going to do a call-in show live stream the next day on sunday so stay tuned for all of that i'm gonna have y'all updated on every draft pick that we make weaknesses strengths all of that type of stuff how they fit the scheme everything so make sure y'all stay tuned i'm super excited i have y'all covered everything draft i promise you so i appreciate y'all just stay patient with me let me know in the comment section how you feel about everything discussed in this video i'm trying my best to read and reply to as many comments as possible but as y'all can see i was on vacation super busy still trying to find a way to fit videos in then then i've been busy since i got back whole lot of yard work everything now i'm about to be extremely busy again and away from home for a little while so just stay tuned i got y'all appreciate y'all i'm gonna catch y'all later i'm out oh.